we can talk about what's changed, how you're using it, but do any of you have any ideas or, or what you would like to see come down the road next? It's not a revolution. It's a, a focus away from gear and back to storytelling. Uh, I think we've become gear obsessed in the past decade. Uh, you know, definitely I was one of the first people to shoot with the 5D Mark II in 2008, and I've just seen such a focus on what camera are you shooting, you know, what frame rate are you shooting, what resolution are you shooting. And the irony for me is I think it's about everything but that. You know, you can shoot, you know, in photography with a pinhole camera, it's a little more complicated in cinema. But, um, you know, I would like to see a focus back on craft. I think that's the most important thing because the gear is effectively evening out the field. You know, you used to have the excuse of going to a film school and getting a roll of film and getting a process and only being able to shoot, you know, for a few days or a few weeks, a year of, of your entire education at film school. Whereas now you can shoot any second you want with your iPhone, you know, or a Canon, whatever, you know, uh, C300, C100, et cetera. And um, that's evening out the field in terms of gear. And I think the only way most of you guys are going to make, you know, yourself stand out is with your ideas and your execution. And that's the most important part going forward, I think. I can. I would totally agree with this. I think, um, especially I, like 10 years ago when we were still shooting on mini DV camcorders and stuff like that, there was a big jump when the 5D came out and really, you know, leveled the playing field, so to speak. Um, but now there's like so many cameras. It's almost every camera you can get um, delivers a very cinematic image if you wanted to. Um, and it doesn't matter, you know, you can go from really inexpensive, you can get like a 700D or you can go up to the C300 Mark II or C500. It's really, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. So that, this is why I think I agree and, and this is why the focus should go away from, from gear uh, again because it's, it's not like there are a lot of people still using, you know, uh, camcorders to shoot movies on anymore. It's like now the quality of the content needs to uh, differentiate the, um, the actual product, uh, not just the looks of it. I think of cameras as film stock, and I think that when you have the story that you want to tell, each story will indicate what camera you want to use. And I think it's wonderful that there are so many options to choose from, and it's really about figuring out which one is right. And a lot of times you'll find that there might be one camera that fits with a lot of the things that you're doing, but not every camera is going to be right for everything. And you can't just go out and buy one camera and say, I'm set. I'm gonna shoot everything on this one camera because it's not gonna work and it's not gonna be the right look and it's not gonna be the right feel. So I think if we kind of think of cameras as if it's film stock and choosing that specifically for our stories. Yeah, I, I concur. Uh, that, that's an exceptionally good point. Um, I started, um, I think I shot my first video in 1973 at Madison Square Gardens on quarter inch black and white reel to reel. And the camera was the size of an American tourister suitcase on my shoulder. And then I had another suitcase that was a recorder hanging over my shoulder. Uh, in between, I shot a lot of Panavision. The cameras were all big. As the cameras are getting smaller and smaller, I think that's a huge advantage. Um, it's really, for me, a lot about the glass in terms of the technological aspects. I uh, had occasion to interview Derek Jobert, who's one of the National Geographic explorers in residence. And he, I, I saw a compilation of all of his life's work. And as they cut to him on the camera cars, he's a, a filmmaker in Botswana. And as they cut back to him, every time the camera was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But the one consistency was the quality glass. And he and I spoke about that. And he invests heavily in glass. And the cameras are almost something that you use for the period of time that they're relevant. Toss them over your shoulder and move forward. Um, and then uh, coming back to what Vincent said in terms of storytelling, uh, my training was in graphic design and illustration, so I can draw a little bit. And that was actually my entree into Hollywood, was the ability to do storyboards. Graphic novels are a great way to learn storytelling in a storyboard type approach. If you look at how the uh, graphic novels are laid out, you get an incredible education in shot structure. And uh, I suggest that you you look at those sorts of things as a way to sort of uh, enhance your narrative filmmaking technique. All right, well, I think everybody said it all, so. Um, I, I would add, similar to Eve's comment to me, it's, you know, a technology moving forward, I, I'm actually looking at buying glass from the 1970s right now, so I'm kind of going backwards. 
Um, and the reason being is I, most modern lenses are too sharp and I don't like the look of them. So everybody's opinion of what they think they want to have or um, gear wise is going to be different. So you have lenses as a, one type of film stock, you have the camera body as a different kind of film stock. What filters are you putting on the front of that lens as well is going to change the way you have that look. So in terms of technology and looks, I don't know, it's, it's never ending possibilities. Um, but it really all goes back to your pre-production and what you actually are doing to build your story before you go into the field. Because it doesn't matter what camera or what piece of technology you're using, if you don't know what you're doing and you're just running around shooting a bunch of footage, that good luck. Joe, so this, you know, you can come back with the same stuff, but uh, what advice, this is a, a question that was a pre-written question for us. What, what um, kind of piece of advice would you wish you had gotten early in your career that might have been really useful that you didn't, you know, it took you till now to learn? I, I, the biggest advice is, I would say, is just take your time when you're building a story and spend the time before you start shooting is the biggest thing. I think I always, and even will today on some projects, just, I just want to jump into it and like, all right, let's get going. But unless you spend the time with a notepad and just thinking and writing down ideas and ways that you can ap approach you know, the shooting or your subject or your talent or whatever you're doing, um, it starts to get your brain going and you start to think about different ways you can, you can do it and accomplish your goal versus just shooting. So I think the biggest thing is to slow down, take time to think about everything before you even touch any piece of gear, even a computer, um, and let those stories start to run wild. So that's 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 be the biggest piece of advice is slow down. Everybody's attention span is so slow, I mean so quick now. I mean if you have three seconds you're like, all right, next thing, next thing, next thing, but You've got to slow yourself down for filmmaking. It's really important. I'm going to almost contradict by saying <laughs> <laughs> um, think long, work fast. Um, there's a, a saying among a carpenters, measure twice, cut once. And it, it goes right back to what you're saying in terms of good strategy going in, yeah. but learn to work quickly. I'm, I'm a commercial filmmaker. I don't do personal projects very often. I love to. Once in a while, I do little personal projects. But for the most, I'm on the clock. And the way I make money is by being fast and efficient. So work on your technique on your personal projects. Don't learn the craft on your first paying jobs. Go in as a professional and then be quick and efficient, having figured out what you should do. But I want to also add that I think it's very important to manage your career through the development of your style. Style is. Uh, to a style is what emerges over time and your style can just peak right at the time that it is inappropriate so it's good to be able to have a lot of different directions going on that you're exploring I think uh, for, for me I've, I've been a filmmaker for pushing 40 years and used to be that I could reinvent myself about every five years refresh the look reintroduce myself into the market now I think it's a much shorter time period. Much like the technology is constantly evolving, I try to constantly evolve my look so that I'm a new kid arriving on the block about every 18 months now. Um, I don't want to make it sound like it doesn't matter uh, what you do, but it does matter that you develop and you constantly grow. Um, I think when I think back to, film, to my times in the film school, um, I felt like we didn't get to shoot a lot, and that is the biggest problem. I think you need to practice, 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 and to take every job you can get your hands on, even if it's a boring event type of thing, whatever it is, everything makes you better as a filmmaker. If you are a shooter, you need to shoot. If you want to be a director, you need to direct. There's a lot of, especially in directors, I see a lot of people planning their feature film script for five, ten years, and not shooting anything uh, in the meantime. You don't get better as a director, not directing, um, you need to do things, even if you work on a feature film or preparing a feature film script, you need to work on short films. You need to you know, sharpen your craft. Um, and the same is, is true for uh, directors of photography. So what I'm hearing are all good pieces of advice that sound contradictory at times, because they are. You know, the hardest thing about filmmaking is finding a balance between uh, waiting for that perfect opportunity, for the perfect film, or everything to be right, the perfect script, 
but if you wait too long, you never shoot anything. At the same time, you got to go out and shoot, but we all tell you to slow down and prep. So you've got to find the balance between those two. If one of the pieces of advice I wish I had been given earlier on is when you watch Martin Scorsese, you know, sitting, you know, at the TV, you know, on set, and he just kind of sits there quietly and just nods at the end of the take and goes, "Okay, another one," or you know, whispers something in the first AD's ear. You're like, "I can do that. That's an easy job." I think you sit there and just nod. And the reality is, Martin Scorsese did, you know, one or two or five years of work prior to that in prep. And you know the biggest surprise that you learn the very hard way in filmmaking is all about prep. Ninety-five percent of your job as a director is to have thoughts, communicate them with your keys, develop stuff, write it down, communicate it, work on it. And when you show up on set, you should have relatively little to do other than to finesse what your initial ideas are. And trying to find that balance is the hardest thing. You know, I'm a commercial director. I spend ninety-nine percent of my time on the phone. And meeting people, you know, when I'm actually on set, I'm dancing around. It's like, oh, this is what I love. That's just not the reality. Anyone that tells you that you spend, you know, so much time shooting is it's just not true. And um, the first time you ever show up on set unprepared is the last time. I think everyone will remember that. It's terrifying when the whole crew turns around, looks at you, and says, "What's next?" You're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, that's not a good thing. Always be prepared. The crew will always forgive you for mistakes, but they'll never forgive you if you're not prepared. To kind of just go on, in addition to prep, I was going to talk about that as well. And the prep for me, the best piece of advice I can give is to find your, your crew, find your people. Find those people that want to prep with you, that want to spend the time, that are, that are totally psyched to go to the rental house and spend hours there. And you'll get stuck there for days. But it's cool, because you think it's fun, and you're learning the thing. So build in prep time. The more that you can prep, the better you're going to be on set. And one of the things that I wish someone had told me sooner was to find those people. Find your first AC. I work as a cinematographer, mostly independent stuff, and I have my team. I have my first AC. I have my gaffer. I have my key grip. And they're my people. And I don't, I don't want to ever be on set without them. And I can't do the work that I can do. That it, I can't do it as well if they're not there. So find your people. Keep them close and keep using them. <laughs> do you, how do you stay abreast of the changes i'm talking about technology now is there do you trade stuff out and and go with something new every few years every 18 months or talk about that yeah i i i probably i might own more equipment than the rest of these people combined because i work in a small town i work in a town of about uh 80, people less than the population of times square at any given moment um I don't generally shoot there, I shoot all over the planet. And rental houses, I, I haven't been inside a rental house since the 80s, I guess. So I, I constantly tur turn over equipment. Um, there are a lot of people that go, oh, I can't wait till I pick up one of those C300s used because the price will be in half. My philosophy is when I buy a piece of equipment, it's like buying a hot fudge sundae. I get the top half of the hot fudge sundae. I get the top uh, scoop of ice cream, the whipped cream, the nuts, and the cherry on top, somebody's going to come in and pay me half of what I paid to buy it from me later, and they get the bottom half of the Sunday. So I get the technology fairly early. <laughs> I relish it. The ice cream. And, uh, uh, and then I move on. Um, I really liked the comment that it's like a film stock. Uh, we used to do a lot of stuff where we'd mix 35 millimeter with Super 8, and you did it specifically for the differential and the look. Um, definitely inspired by equipment, not driven by it, but inspired by it. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up a camera that has particularly excellent low light capabilities. So I go out and do a low light experiment to see what it can do for me. Now that's adding another arrow in my quiver, another tool in my toolbox. Um, Speaking to what you said, I buy old FD lenses and modify them. I buy old uh, Leica R lenses to mix in with my regular Canon glass. I have uh, a, a ton of glass, um, and the bodies just move through. Um, I make fairly practical decisions on equipment. If a camera line suddenly changes the battery style, I'm not going to jump on right away because I've got 35 batteries that fit the current uh, 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 complement of cameras that I, uh, I'm using. So for me to move to 
fully embrace something, it has to have a good continuity of technical history for me to be able to uh, really trust it and jump into it really quickly. But uh, yeah, so, and for me, lighting was kind of the thing that uh, was my entree into Hollywood. I started as a still photographer. I feel like I have a lot of kinship with the folks sitting in the front rows here because uh, I entered a competition when I was 20, 21, uh, at one of the fashion magazines here in Manhattan. I was working in a Texaco station, changing the oil on cars and doing brake jobs. Uh, dating a girl that worked at the mall. She was into fashion. I was into oil and snow tires. Um, picked up a fashion magazine. There was a contest. I entered it. I won it. I was a guest art director at Condé Nast, and I was shooting runway in Paris the next day. So Texaco on Friday, Paris on Monday. Um, still had the oil under my fingernails. Uh, it, it, it was quite a process, you know, to start your career. And this competitions like this are, are really excellent. Uh, I really have no idea how I would have found my way out of the Midwest and into the career. But at the end of that competition, I moved into a 4,000 square foot loft in Fifth Avenue. And I was shooting fashion, and it's never slowed down. The lighting that I did on the projects that I entered, some fashion type photography, uh, got me some uh, attention. And then from there, I was able to segue into motion capture. So it's been pretty interesting. And you guys are all at the, the brink of a really great opportunity, I'd say. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to, to add just a little bit there. Um, we saw from a lot of the uh, contestants and candidates for this workshop um, really extraordinary use of technology. Um, and uh, it reminded me, I don't know how, who has seen the uh, Oscar winning film from the 90s, The English Patient, um, where uh, I think the cinematographer uh, John Seale you know, won an Oscar and then Anthony Minghella won an Oscar. And it has extraordinary aerial photography of the desert, of the African desert, and um, which in and of itself is just beautiful, but it is absolutely connected to the story. It, it, it is integral to the story. It's part of the story because there's, it has to do with a, a pilot who, who crashes. Um, we saw from a, some of you who are here also unbelievable aerial photography that you would never have seen in a contest <laughs> 20 years ago. Um, and that is about the technology that has, has made that possible. And hopefully you're using it uh, you know, in, in a way that is true to the story or advances the story. But, so I was going to just also turn it over to you, some way in which, though we've already established that it is about story, that technology made something possible for you, or that it, you know, as Bruce was saying, that it, it, it authentically helped him do something, and then did affect his, his way of telling the story. Here, Nino. Well, technology is definitely enabling a lot of things. As you mentioned, I mean, aerial photography, um, videography, I hate the term, but that is something that's really come around over the past few years and it's now so affordable. Um, you can get the most amazing aerial uh, cinematography done for literally no money. There's a whole other legal aspect to it that will haunt us in the coming years um, because where I'm from in Austria, we are they have now introduced one of the strictest laws against, I mean, not against, but for aerial uh, drone footage because uh, you need to have a redundancy system and all these kind of things that will move over to the rest of Europe and the States at some point because there's so many problematic things going on right now uh, with drones. But having said that, uh, once this is kind of dealt with, uh, there is still, it will be a more regulated type of thing um, and uh, it will still be around. So the technology is definitely enabling. Uh, for me, one of the things that has changed a lot is the size of cameras. Um, the, the ability to have really, really small cameras um, and go into very tight places and also have them capture light um, much differently than they used to do, like much more light sensitive. You can literally shoot without artificial light, like without added light in any, anything that your eye can see, a camera can see. Now, very often the camera can see even more. Um, and the, especially nighttime uh, filmmaking has, has, has been fundamentally changed. Um, and, you know, where even for big productions where you used to have uh, a lighting truck and change out all the bulbs and stuff like that, 
um, this is not the case anymore. You can literally shoot under any light with cameras. So this is really revolutionizing what, what you are able to shoot. Does anyone have any particular examples of, of projects you've done recently that are been affected this way? I mean, I would, <clears throat> this is all the same things that, that he just said, but um, I would say specifically when um, I was shooting a project for Canon this year, we were using the five, I mean, sorry, the uh, C100 Mark II, and we had a nighttime uh, shot where I was like, well, let's capture the stars, and I was like, well, we'll just use a 5D, and we'll, we'll shoot the sky, and then superimpose it in, or something, so we can actually see it, but I think it was at ISO 10,000 or 12,000, I can't remember exactly, but you could actually see the stars with the video, and I was like, that's crazy. So that was actually something that was really impressive to me, and um, I don't believe you actually used any noise reduction. We just threw a little bit of um, 35 millimeter grain on top of it, and it looks great. And I'll show, I'm showing it later today, but that was a, mm -hmm. a shoot that really impressed me that I could do that. So, I guess one of the tricks is when you see new technology come out, ask yourself what story would this technology allow me to tell that I couldn't previously tell? You know, or what, um, what way of moving the camera, or what approach to lighting, or what approach to not lighting does this technology enable me? And then try to adapt a story or find a story that matches that, marries with that. That's the key. You're always going to have new technologies come out, and you'll see two different types of pieces that come out. Demo pieces that just have no story and are purely technical, which tend not to go very far. But if you can find some sort of a story that aligns itself with it, um, you'll find that people really kind of react to it. And it might take off and go viral if you're one of the first people to do it. You don't have to be one of the first people to do it either. You just have to be one of the first people to do it well. I guess I'm going to say something now. <laughs> <laughs> Eve, you, I know you, you've uh, been doing some work in, in virtual reality, right? Yeah. Um, Has that been, is that something maybe yeah. this, this is relevant to in terms of yeah. the kinds of... <laughs> no, I am. I'm just, I, I, I'm, trying to think, to I'm trying to think of a specific good example, but yeah. I think it's, it's more of an overall example that yeah. um, I've been working in what we're calling like independent VR, which is very low budget tiny we're using like an array of four gopros and it's mm -hmm. possible and it's awesome and the fact that you can do virtual reality with four cameras that you can easily purchase yeah. you don't need to rent them you don't need tons of storage space for it um, has been really impressive and it's very new i've only we've only done two projects with it thus far but uh this would, would never have been possible without the tiny cameras and you can fit them in such small, amazing spaces too. You just really capture things without having to. As a compliment to the the ISO sensitivity that we've seen, you know, it's it's kind of gone to nosebleed elevations. Uh, when we were shooting a film, it was ISO 50 routinely, and that was actually nice. I'd like to see the ISOs not skyrocket. I'd li I wish the cameras, rather than have an ISO 128 billion, <laughs> I'd like them to have ISO six or 12. Um, you know, the, the, my, my approach is, is uh, expose for the highlights and light for the shadows, fill the shadows as I need to. And I'm always carrying some kind of lighting instruments. While you can shoot in any light, maybe you shouldn't uh, shoot in the existing light you find. It certainly establishes the look of the scene and gives you a good starting point. But uh, I always approach it as sweetening. It used to be that we would have to go in and light from scratch. I mean, I remember carbon arcs and then uh, HMIs and all of the headaches involved with that to get enough light for interior shooting. That's no longer a prob problem. Now I migrate toward the smallest light sources I can. I lived through the horrible fluorescent light period, which was just a tragedy as far as I'm concerned. The LEDs are fantastic, the dimmable LEDs. Uh, daylight balance, you know, and uh, uh, light them for tungsten when you need to, gel them for tungsten. Uh, I'm really mostly interested in small instruments these days, something that you can uh, work with quickly, that you can travel with. I travel all over the place, I'm sure everybody up here does, uh, and it is expensive. And so uh, small instruments, small cameras, small, 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 that's the biggest freeing element that I've found so far. All right, since I've kind of dragged us into the technology, um, I was gonna kicking and streaming, okay, go ahead. I was just going to add to that, you know, it's. Um, 
with this, the technology and how small cameras have gotten as well, like you're saying, the lighting has gotten a lot smaller. And I think as you learn and as your, um, you know, your expertise gets better, especially if you're in the, in the DP world, you start realizing you go from using bigger instruments to smaller instruments because you learn not to overlight. You learn to, you know, look at the natural light you have there. What can you add to make it feel real? You know, feel like it's a real moment versus you know throwing thirty lights in a room and then it just looks fake. Um, and it's all about for me. I use a lot of just um, household lights. You know, I'll pull bulbs out, um, put them in places just because I like the look of it. And I like the way that the fall up of the light works. And with the cameras we have now, you don't need to throw, you know, a couple 5K HMIs in a room. It's not necessary, you know. Look at what you have and the technology with the LEDs. It's just, it's amazing the small lights you can use. What a, a portable kit, your essential portable kit that you would go with. And what is your go-to Canon lens for that kit, portable, if, portable if you use it? for what? For, uh, good question, and maybe that's part of the answer, but... Um, uh, that you would, yeah, let's go to start with Eve and I'll try to reframe the question. <laughs> um, I shoot a lot of uh, documentary and independent docs and also reality television and the go-to kit is C300s, two of them with three lenses, the uh, 24, no, <laughs> well, sometimes it's four lenses, three, <laughs> three main ones. 24 to 105, uh, 70 to 200, and the wide, which is 16 to 35. And um, I always have a couple filters that I'll throw in front. Um, I like a quarter black pro mist. Always have your polarizers. Um, and that's the standard, the standard package. And then depending on what kind of shoot it is, I'll either outfit it with um, a really great handheld rig so that I can have the right amount of weight. Um, yeah, pretty easy. If someone's just like, we have to go out and shoot tomorrow, just send them my list. Here it is. Give me some C300s and do anything with them. Um, I mean, if I have to be honest, I really don't have a standard kit. It's every job, you know, like you pick your palette, you pick your camera, you pick your lenses. Sometimes you want primes when you have time or you want to be really small and lightweight. Sometimes you want zoom lenses when you'll be really fast and you don't have time for lens changes. Uh, sometimes you know you're going to have all handheld, all day, heavy, or you're going to have a crew with a dolly or whatever it is, or a slider. It all depends on what the job needs and what the story calls for. And the ability to recognize that will come with experience. But you could start a, a standard kit. I think I could shoot, if I had to really pick one lens, a 24 mil, uh, almost anything. Uh, in cinema, and, and then go to a 50, and then maybe go extremely back to like a 14 or something for ultra wides. But um, I think you have to know what you're shooting or what you're trying to accomplish before you can pick a ge your gear, and that's the step that gets missed a lot of times. Uh, I'm a big proponent of renting if you're in a market like New York, so you can try stuff out uh, as opposed to buying everything. I understand why someone like Bruce has to buy stuff because you don't have the resources you have in New York City you know, X amount of rental houses to go to. Uh, but even now you have, you know, Lens Pro to go and other places that will ship you stuff. And I'm a big proponent of that. So you try stuff out as opposed to spending so much money to realize, you know, that, you know, these days, unfortunately, they don't pay you half for the second half of the ice cream cone. The ice cream's melted, so they might pay you 10%. Um, and that's, that's an issue you have to deal with. But, you know, really just ask yourself what, you have to try to close your eyes and pre-visualize what it is you're trying to accomplish and then talk to someone like Eve and say, here's what I'd like to do. Because if you're a director or a filmmaker, the other piece of understanding is you don't necessarily have to be technically proficient. You have to know what you want to accomplish. How is what the entire crew is there to do for you and with you. You know, you, they won't forgive you if you're not prepared and if you don't know what you want. They don't, if you don't know how to get it, they don't care. They're there to enable you to do that. So, you know... Yeah, ask someone like Eve, hey, I want that look. Or I, you see that film that does that? Or you see that move? How do I get that? That's totally OK. As opposed to showing up like a vegetable and going, mm -hmm. you know, or we're going to shoot with this, 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 and that. And Eve is like, why internally? Why are you choosing that? You know, do you read it in this? Well, of course, <laughs> it's a professional. But that's the key. It's like, you know, every job calls for a certain type of kit. And I think you need to realize that. Because if you bring, okay, the biggest mistake I've ever made, speaking of mistakes, I think the question is coming up, yes, is bringing every up. piece of gear and the kitchen sink. 
and not being able to actually move as a group, let alone have time to build stuff, and missing so much stuff because you're busy lugging so much crap that you're not shooting. Yeah, I <laughs> couldn't agree more. For me also, the it really depends on the job. I mean, about 50% of what I shoot is TV, documentary type of things, um, sometimes cinema, um, and the other half is commercials, corporate. And there's totally different requirements depending on the job. It also depends very much on the crew I'm working with. For documentary, it's very much, very often a very small crew. So we're talking about, you know, three to five people. Um, for commercials, corporates can go up to 20, 30 easily. Um, and dependent on that, I choose the gear and also, of course, the subject matter. Um, if you would ask me what, what would be my one camera and one go-to lens for a particular job for documentary, I would probably choose a C300 and the 17120, you know, the server zoom. Beautiful lens, quite expensive, but it's the most versatile documentary lens on the market. Uh, also for the um, the size and weight that it has, um, it's quite unique actually. It's th that's the one lens I've been waiting for for a long time in documentary because you really, what's annoying about shooting documentaries on photo lenses and primes, if you do that, is just juggling lenses because you need to act fast and you just don't have the time to to swap lenses all the time. This is why, you know, with this lens I can go into a r room, get a nice wide shot and nice close up, and I don't mind that it loses one and a half, two stops at the very end, really doesn't matter because it allows me to get um, shots that I wouldn't be able to get if I had to change them all the time. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, fully agree. Um, depends on the job. I, I've been on jobs where I've had three 40-foot trailers and crew of 100. More recently, I'm kind of a one-man band. Uh, I'm just coming off of a four-year uh, documentary uh, intermittently on it for four years where we I was part of a, a team of uh, explorers that uh, drove across all seven continents and we drove around the world twice and uh, I started the the trip anticipatory of shooting with all kinds of uh, uh, time to work and, and all kinds of cool setups I think I probably had 175 pounds of gear when I started at the end of it I had a C100 Mark II, a 28 to 300, and a couple of SD cards and my laptop. <laughs> and I picked the C100 because it shoots SD cards and my Mac PowerBook has an SD card slot. <laughs> One wire that I could eliminate was great. Everything had to be in my lap. I'd jump out of the vehicles. The guys would do drive-bys. They never came back for some reason. I always had to jog after them. <laughs> but, um, so I spent a lot of time running. And the other thing is uh, not a gimbal, uh, a Steadicam. I started with the little Steadicam Merlin, which is a little tricky to balance. Now I tend to travel with uh, two Steadicam solos, one, one set up and pre-rigged for high mode and one set up for low mode. No batteries. If I can avoid one battery charger, that is the tail that wags the dog on, on a one-man band type of approach. But I was in uh, the, the dunes of Namibia on the Skeleton Coast in these incredible sandstorms. The concept of changing a lens is, was impossible to consider. So that 28 to 300 went on at the beginning of the trip, came off at the end of the trip. Uh, my one mistake was that I didn't take a uh, screw on close-up lens for the front of it because it only focuses down to about five feet at 28 millimeter Which is useless for a wide um, If I could have changed one thing it would have been that so uh, The least amount of equipment to accomplish the task would mm -hmm. be what I would say is my approach mm -hmm. right. um, So I would just I mean agreeing with everything everybody has said down the line so far um, my kit varies vastly depending on the shoot I'm working on. And I think as I've gotten older and, and more experienced, my kit gets smaller, um, which is weird. Because I think you get all gung-ho when you're young. You're like, I'm going to have a slider, and I'm going to have this movie, I'm going to have a crane, and I'm going to have like a ton of <laughs> and you don't use half of it. So my last shoot, I just came back from Thailand. I had um, an FS7. I had a 24 to 105 lens which I used with the Metabones adapter, so at times I could make it wider or have more distance on it with the speed booster. And then I shot everything handheld, and that was it. 
and a Rode microphone. And that was the whole project. That was it. Traveled around, had a strap carried around me. I was on the back of motorcycles, hanging on to people's taxis, shooting stuff. Just I was able to get the whole job done with that. And I also had a 5D Mark III to shoot some time lapses, but that was all the gear I had for the entire shoot. So it really just depends on the job. You know, other times I'll have a, a red and a phantom and crazy lenses and a 30 person crew, you know, it just depends on the job. Um, I think my, my go-to kit depends on what I need. You know, it's like I have a C1, uh, C100 Mark II, um, which is an amazing camera and it's quick and it's easy, takes SD cards um, and it's cheap. And that's a camera we'll use for a lot of projects, but you know, it, it doesn't really do high speed um, footage. So if I need a high speed camera, I'm gonna use something else. So it's, you know, what are you shooting? Uh, and that's what always comes back to is, you know, what's gonna work for you. Um, my favorite lens, um, the Canon lens, I would say, is the, the 30 to 105. Um, zoom is amazing. It's a cinema, cinema lens. Um, second to that, I like the 50. Um, it's probably my, one of my most used lenses, of just a 50 prime. I just, I just love that focal length. Um, you can make a lot of things look really nice with that. So, yeah. Um, well, uh, I have a couple more questions, um, but it, we also may want to have... David, a chance for a couple questions from the audience here. Is that all right? Right. I saw your your hand up uh, first, right there. On the grip, yeah. I'd love to hear. Uh, I'd love to hear some times where you had an idea that fit with your story, but you actually didn't have the technology to do what you envisioned. And how did you overcome that? What did you have to? make the technology? What what do you have to do? So you prepare weeks and weeks or months or days or hours and you arrive and even if you have the technology it doesn't work. One of the most important skills to have is the ability to pivot and to let it go. So I want to give you the opposite which is say of course you can try to figure out some really clever way of making that work or forcing it but a very important discipline as a director is to, when you see your crew struggling with that crane or that movie or whatever it is, and you see it's just not going to happen and you've wasted X amount of time just prepping it, you've got to have discipline to say, all right, plan B, handheld right here where the B cam over there and go. Done. Get my master wide and my old tighter shot and we're out of here moving on so you can make your day. That's one of the toughest disciplines to, 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 to have is to be able to sit back as a director and realize and talk to your DP, why is this taking so long? Why aren't we getting this? And you're the only person on set, with the exception of the DP, when something's not working out, that should be trying to identify why is it not working? Is it the blocking of the actors? Is it the gear? Is the shot too difficult? You know, does the, uh, does the th first AC need a few more stops of depth of field? Do we need to shoot a little wider? And um, that's one of the most important skills, I think, is the ability to just let it go. Because the worst thing you can do, we're talking about all this gear, is you just, you're dead set on that crane shot. And you're going to spend two hours on it. You're going to get your crane shot. It's probably going to suck in the end anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but you have no film. And that's the, the biggest lesson I had to learn from going from still photography into film is that you get that one still, you're gold. You got that perfect photo. Film doesn't matter if you don't have the ending shot and if it's a sequence ultimately. And you've always got to remember that, that the obsession with each shot will ultimately hurt you unless you have the budget, time, and people. Remembering always that it's how everything comes together and that that one really fancy shot might kill your entire day, let alone your entire film. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll get you. Right, you'll, just, you'll, cut it, you'll cut it anyway. It's if you, know, if you know the story, and for me as a DP, I will always sit down with the director and know every single scene that's happening. What is that one moment that we have to capture in that scene? What's that one thing? And if there's some amazing technical, you know, way of getting that, there's also going to be the non-technical way of getting it. Because looking through that camera, you're going to know, all right, I got that moment. And it would be great if I got that moment from a crane, but I can also get that moment down here. So it's all back, back to story. Excellent. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I rarely honestly had this. I mean, it never happened to me that I, you know, I wanted to do this. I couldn't do it because I didn't have the tool for it. It's more like you have the story and then you think what you need to get it done uh, because this sounds more like well I want to do this super fancy thing but I don't know how um, right now I think I mean this 
probably used to be the case like 10, 15 years ago when cameras were really, you know, not that great. Um, but nowadays uh, you're very versatile with what you want to do. Unless, I mean, if you want to shoot a 90 minutes feature in one take, that's probably going to be hard. Possible, but <laughs> um, if I reach for a tool and it's not there, I reach for that same tool two or three times and it's not there. I eventually build it. So um, I, I'll, I'll share a story that I heard from uh, my key grip back a few years back. A guy named Tom Prophet. He came. Uh, he was on my job and he had finished uh, doing Blood Simple for the Coen Brothers, which was their first movie, and they had minimal budget. And he told story after story about problem solving. They were doing one of the scenes, uh, I think it was in a bar, and they wanted to do a dolly shot where they would have you bangied out over the top of the bar and drag the camera down as the beer slides down the bar, something like that. They didn't have the equipment to do it. Got some pledge wax, waxed the top of the bar, took a carpet sample, flipped it over, put the camera on the carpet sample, dragged it down the bar. At the end, when they were finding the grave out in the middle of nowhere, out in the snow-covered cornfield, they needed a crane. They didn't have one, but they got about 20 risers for the Fisher dolly. You know, uh, there's a scene where a camera, uh, somebody's in a house, uh, bad guys are cruising back and forth past, and the camera rushes up to the screen door. That was a no steady cam. It was a two by four with bungee cords underslinging the camera. Y you can be really resourceful. And I think that's a part of the creative process, is being resourceful. Uh, I, I, I totally hear you on kill the babies. The thing that you fight the hardest for is oftentimes the worst thing to fight for. But if you want to get a shot and you don't have, don't imagine that you can't do it just because you can't get a piece of gear that is super expensive or on the other side of the planet. Just uh, open up your brain to sort of, sort of Stone Age technology and see if you can fix it that way. Um, <laughs> we can take another question if you want. Yeah, I, have, I don't know. I just not, I'm not really a builder of things myself. <laughs> um, I've seen um, my um, key grip and gaffer do some amazing things. And I'm like, I want to put a light there. And I don't think it's possible. And somehow they do it. I don't know how. It's like magic. But um, usually for me, it's like if, if we don't have the technology to do it, I'm going to find a workaround because... There's so many instances where I waste time, like Vince is saying, like trying to create this amazing shot and it's basically worthless at the end because it doesn't look that good and it doesn't fit the story and it, we just did it because we thought it would be cool. and We don't use it. So uh, I, I'm always thinking like what fits the story? What's the easiest way to capture that that's not going to distract the audience? Because if the filmmaking is so fancy that people are like, oh, look how cool that shot is, then they're out of story. And so what's the point of doing it? So go back to the story. Well, that's what we will be doing with, with uh, the filmmakers here this week um, over the next few days, working with you and uh, figuring out answers to a lot of these questions in the field and really uh, seeing how much uh, we can understand uh, how the story guides uh, the production process and the decisions you make on set. Um, I think, uh, oh, another, maybe we have time for, do we have time for anyone? Yeah, we'll, we'll do one more question. And uh, also, kind of in regards to what you're saying, I just got some good news. We've sourced more batteries. Canon has found more batteries <laughs> as well. So here you go. Magic. OK, so as I look out into the crowd, there's not many um, women. So I mean, this question is geared more towards Eve. But it would be interesting to see opinions for, um, from the rest of the panel as well. Um, have you faced any challenges being uh, a woman in the industry, or do you see that it's hindered your career in any way? What's your, what's your um, role? Of, what, what do you do? Oh, uh, I like to do cinematography. I do a lot of editing. I'm pretty sure I'm the youngest one here. If anyone else is 18, um, but yeah. Yeah, I think that I think it's difficult being a woman in this industry. But I also think that if you are dedicated to what it is you want to do and you go after that, and you just show that you're good at it, and you're talented, and you're just as good as anybody else sitting up here, uh, you find your people, and you find the people that like to work with you. And it's, it's really, it's just about dedication and not giving up, because it's definitely a lot of people that try to defer you. But don't let them, because you can do it. I think this is the best time in history to be a woman in filmmaking, because you're seeing an explosion of it, first of all. As directors, writers, uh, every every position, 
uh, in the past five or so years, you know, and the attention the spotlight's been put on. This is one of the most male-dominated uh, businesses I've ever seen. And it comes back to, I think, it being a very insular business. Um, the reason behind it, you know, definitely some sexism for sure. But it's a, pl a, it's a very kind of nepotistic business because the, the costs are so high that people are, tend to be risk adverse and then they, they tend to go back to people they know and have worked with before. And that's the reason, you know, even for a young filmmaker, regardless of what sex you are, it's hard to get in because there's so much on the line that people are very risk adverse. That's the, that was the biggest surprise I found going into Hollywood is how risk adverse they were to technology and to change. And when you're on the other side of it as a producer, you're scared. You want to hire the people you know have done it before. Um, so that being said, I don't see a single reason why a woman can't do what a, a guy does in this business in any position whatsoever, even handling the he heaviest camera, you know, cameras out there. I've seen, you know, you know, Polly, I worked with Polly Morgan to handle a camera that I couldn't handle. You know, I would cry after five minutes and she did it for 14 and 12, 14 hours a day. So um, this is the best time to do it and just, you know, it's needed, so. Just, talk, just talking about risk, it just made me think of this, that um, the studio system, there's a certain amount of risk that they're gonna take and they're willing to hire a female director and then they're not willing to also hire a female cinematographer. They won't hire both. It's very rare. They'll take the risk on one, but they won't take it down the line. So I think it's really important for a lot of directors out there to also make that stand and hire cinematographers that are women because there's actually, it's 2% of us, that's it. There's a lot of directors and producers and writers and editors and the DPs, we are, we are very few. So uh, take some more risks, take a double risk, hire women to do both of the things. Any last comments from the panel? Um, I'll just share that I recall uh, working with uh, female DP 83 um, on automotive, which was pretty interesting. Some big, badass focus poles on super telephotos. She was the right person for the job. Uh, she was fantastic. Um, I do a lot of work with Steadicam. I'm a demo artist for Steadicam, and I, the last trade show, I guess it was, um, uh, NAB, uh, they had uh, a number of Steadicam demo people there, and they were all young women. Uh, from all around the country. That's a, a huge area right now. I think it has a lot to do with uh, grace, actually, you know, graceful movement and strength, but the, the package itself kind of helps with uh, distributing the weight so the physicality isn't uh, a, a deal breaker on it. And then um, for all my time in Hollywood, it was almost exclusively commercial production. Um, I would say that over 50% of the women on my crews and uh, certainly in my production company were women. So I, it's kind of a non-issue as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, I was basically just saying the same stuff as everybody else, but it's any- what you always say. Any, <laughs> I'm always the last to get the microphone at this point. Um, you can, anybody in this room can do anything they want. It's just, you have to follow your passion. You have to be willing to work hard and you have to just learn to follow what you actually want to do as far as like your style and not try to do something someone else is doing because you think it's cool because you will realize at some point that that's not really you. So you have to find your style, get it out there and find people to work with and that's it. Because once you're, you, you show your work and you show you have good work ethic and you have a great attitude, then people want to work with you because that's what matters. Um, working with people that are on set, no one wants to deal with that. They will not get hired again even if their work is really awesome. It's just not worth it. So that's what it comes down to. Yeah. You know? I think also, um, I think there are luckily a lot of women in the industry. There should be many more, but um, with, I mean, all of us work a lot also with manufacturers at trade shows and stuff. And this whole gear centric business of trade shows is very male because we are geeks. And we like our computers, we like our cameras much more than women do, I think. Um, and as soon as you move out of that little scope of gear-centric talk, which is too much anyway, as men Vincent mentioned in the beginning, uh, you see all the women working in the industry. If you actually go out there, there are a lot of women there, and there should be more. But I think, you know, you guys are a bit more reasonable about all this gear stuff. Um, 
it's easy to say in a panel like this, which is sponsored by manufacturers and we have manufacturers outside. I'm not saying it's not important, but as soon as you move out of this little scope and you move into actual production, you have a lot of women. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.